Well, welcome Pathway Church at all of our locations. Those of you who are watching online to this first weekend of our brand new series, Detox. And for the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about our souls and what makes our souls healthy. Now, all the major religions of the world, most philosophical traditions, and especially Christianity, we believe that the, uh, everybody has a human soul, that we, every person has a human soul. So I really believe, regardless of where you're at in, in your spiritual journey, what we're going to be talking about over these next four weeks is really going to connect and really impact exactly where you live. Now, you may be asking yourself the question, why are we talking about the health of our souls? Well, let me explain it this way. I want you to imagine for a moment that you grew up in a house where your parents smoked. And as you were growing up, certainly you didn't think about it very much. It seemed very normal to you. But I want you to then fast forward and think about maybe the point in time where you became 18 years of age. And all of a sudden, after you moved out of the house because of a variety of circumstances, you all of a sudden realized for the first 18 years of your life, you'd been breathing in secondhand smoke. You'd been breathing in a poison that was a toxin to your body. And the same is true for us. That we live in a culture where there's all kinds of secondhand toxins floating around. That we breathe in that are hurting us and harming us and ultimately killing our souls. So what we're going to do over the next four weeks is we're going to be digging into the Scripture and identifying what some of those toxins are and how to do a little bit of detox uh, to be able to get those things out of us. And we're going to be using uh, the book of Jonah really as a backdrop to help identify some of those toxins and to really rid ourselves from them. Now, just to give you a little bit of an idea of where we're going for the next few weeks, next week, I promise you're going to be, want to be here. We're going to be talking about guilt and detoxing ourselves from guilt because a lot of time, a guilt in our lives causes us to end up making all kinds of poor choices. The next week, we're going to be talking about pride. Then the final week, we're going to be talking about de detoxing ourselves from anger. And this week, we're going to be talking about unwillingness about the subtle poison of unwillingness and how unwillingness is really a slow-acting toxin that poisons our soul. Now, in order to understand how unwillingness hurts us and even poisons people around us, uh, let's kind of take a look at the life of Jonah. Now, just to tell you about Jonah, Jonah was a prophet in Israel during the time of Jeroboam II, who reigned from 786 to 746 B.C., and Jonah actually had a really pretty good job. He was well-respected in Israel uh, as a prophet. People uh, generally liked him. But God was going to call Jonah to really a different kind of ministry. And in Jonah chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah and said, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. So God says to Jonah, in a very unambiguous, a very direct way, what he should do. He was to go to Nineveh and to preach. Now, give, let me give you a little bit of a, a context uh, about uh, Nineveh that I think helps inform a little bit of the story today. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian nation. Uh, the Assyrians were probably the most feared people back in the 7th and 8th century B.C., 
They were known not just for conquering nations, but they were known for practicing genocide. There's all kinds of carvings, early carvings of Assyrians torturing the people that they had conquered. And not only did they, they torture them, but they, but they would practice genocide, they would kill them, and they were such a vile people that, that what they would do is they would take the skulls of the people that they had conquered, and they would put them around their necks as necklaces. This is the kind of people that they were. And Israel especially hated the Assyrians. Now, back in the Old Testament, there was a period of time where there, were, uh, a, there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom had ten tribes. The southern kingdom had two tribes of Israel. The Assyrians went in, and they totally wiped out the northern kingdom. And so as a result, uh, the Israelites hated the Assyrians. And remember, Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. So in many ways, Jonah going to Nineveh was kind of like uh, sending an African-American man to kind of a, you know, a group of white supremacists. I mean, it just it was really... Kind of a contrasting thing, but God says to Jonah, verse 2 of Jonah chapter 1, go to Nineveh and preach against it. And this is where I think our story really begins to connect with Jonah's story. Because I think there's all kinds of things that God has said to us, very direct, very personal, about things that he wants us to do. But we have a tendency to take God's commands and interpret them as suggestions. So the first toxin I want you to notice is sometimes we redefine God's commands as suggestions, and when we do that, it's a toxin for our souls. So, so many times we treat God kind of like we would treat a consultant, and we look at God's word kind of like it's advice. Or we come together in a weekend service and we get some tips some tips about how that we are to be able to live so that we can have a happier life. But that's not how God rolls. There's a pastor named Larry Osborne who once said, many of us treat God like a personal consultant rather than the Lord of our lives. A consultant is someone whose wisdom we highly value and listen to, but in the end of the day, we make the final decision. That's why they're called consultants. Here's the problem. God doesn't do consulting. He never has, he never will. He does God. And when we treat him as a consultant, he simply stops showing up for the meetings. You see, when if you're here and you've made Jesus Christ the leader and the savior of your life, I mean, I mean, what you're doing is you're saying, You're the boss. The old school way that we say it is you're the Lord of my life. And so you see, you can't make God the source of your strength. If the world is the source of your standards. And so many times we're, we've got all the sources of the world that are our standards as opposed to God and what he has directly already told us. But the truth is there's so much freedom. There's actually so much freedom when we surrender ourselves to God's direction in our lives. There's so much more freedom when we, we, we don't have to worry anymore about whether we should go to the right or to the left because God gives us direction through his word to be able to know which way we should go. We don't have to worry so much about how cloudy we are emotionally to be able to make good decisions because God gives us a wisdom from his word so that we can make right kinds of decisions. In the end, no, even though it looks a little over the top from the world's perspective, there's so much freedom and that's why Jesus says... John chapter 8, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's what he's talking about. That's what Jesus is talking about. When we follow his commands, it's not really confining, but actually there's freedom. It's a paradox. It's counterintuitive. Everything in the world says, well, that's controlling. But the reality is when you step into God's word and you begin to follow him, there's actually so much freedom in being able to follow him. Let's see what uh, happens next here in our story. God makes it very clear what Jonah is supposed to do. But we look in verse 3, and it says, But Jonah ran away from the Lord, and he headed for Tarshish. So God clearly tells Jonah exactly what he's supposed to do. Jonah doesn't listen to it. He kind of, in the end, he hears what he wants to hear, And then he does whatever he wants to do. And I think you and I 
our story once again, it parallels Jonah many times. Where we hear God's word, but we hear what we want to hear. We pick and choose what we kind of want to take out of God's word, like he is a consultant. We pick and choose those things, and then what we do, we do whatever we want to do. We practice selective hearing. Now, uh, we, you know, I did a little research this last week about selective hearing, and there's actually a clinical term for it. I don't know if you knew it. Selective auditory attention disorder. My wife says that I have it and that most of my kids have it. <laughs> and if there's a medication, please take it. <laughs> Selective attention auditory disorder. And that's a that tendency that we have to hear only what we want to hear and then do whatever that we want to do. And parents, we know how this goes, don't we, in terms of our own house. We've, we've experienced it time and time again, especially kind of in our modern culture um, I want you to imagine yourself, I know you've had this situation happen, particularly if you've got kids at home right now, where you have maybe ask your kid to do something, then they're staring at their iPhone. And you say to them, uh, empty the dishwasher. And what happens? Absolutely nothing. They just keep staring at their phone. I mean, it was like you didn't even say anything. And so what, you, what do you do? Well, you kind of crank the volume of your voice up just a little bit. So you say a little bit louder. Would you please empty the dishwasher? And what do they do? They just keep staring at, at their iPhone. I mean, it's like, it's like you didn't even do anything. There, there's no response whatsoever. But I've got a little parenting tip for you today. Here's what I want you to do the next time that that happens. What I want you to do the next time that happens, I want you to say in a very quiet voice, would you like a bowl of ice cream? And I promise you, their head is going to turn on a swivel, and they're going to turn to you, and they're going to say, what did you say? And you say, empty the dishwasher now. <laughs> See, you can kind of capitalize on their, their attention, their selective hearing, and kind of, you know, make it go for your own uh, means. So, anyway, we all struggle with this kind of selective hearing. So here's the next toxin to your soul. Selective hearing is a toxin to your soul. When you don't, when you selectively hear what you want to hear and then do what you want to do, it damages your soul. So I want you to think for a moment here about some of the areas maybe of your life where you might practice a little bit of selective hearing when it comes to God's Word. For example, maybe someone has hurt you. Maybe hurt you recently or maybe hurt you in the past. But you know God's word has directly come to you and said, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. But inside, at least emotionally for sure, you say, well, God, I don't want to do that. that. That person doesn't deserve to be forgiven. Certainly they haven't done anything that looks like that, that they're moving in the correct direction, that they're sorry for whatever they've done. I'm not going to forgive them. But... The reality is when we don't forgive someone, it damages our soul. I mean, resentment takes root, bitterness grows, and it poisons us, and it ends up defiling other people. And that's why it says in Hebrews chapter 12, see, that, see to it that no one misses the grace of God, and so that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. You see, it damages our soul when we practice selective hearing. It's not just hurting someone else, it damages us. Or another area that we've been talking about in recent weeks in terms of surrendering to God and, and in the area of our finances. And so we know from God's word that he does come to us very directly. Proverbs chapter 3, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. But we say to God, God, I don't want to do that. I mean, i got so many other things I'm trying to get done right now. Get done for myself. Get done for my family. There's so many other things I want to spend my money on, and I don't think you really need my money to do what you're doing. You're God. And so we ignore God's voice. And at the same time, when we ignore God's voice, what do we do? We short-circuit the blessing. What did Jesus very specifically say? He said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. We miss out on the blessing that, that, that God wants to be able to give us. Because you and I both know, if we were to make a list of all the things we would, we've received over the course of time as gifts, it would be hard for us to really even kind of think of what, of what some of those gifts were. But at the same time, 
when we talk about offering or giving someone and, and the joy that we got in giving, either giving of our finances or giving of ourselves and our time, we remember those things. Once again, because it's counterintuitive. Because it is more blessed to give than to be able to receive. And what else do we miss out on? We short-circuit the blessing of God that He wants to be able to move through our lives, for heaven to come to earth through our lives, and for us to be able to be a blessing to the whole rest of the world. We miss out on that. We damage our souls when we do that. Or think about another area of our life where we short-circuit God's blessing through our selective hearing. We do it in terms of our relationships with people of the opposite sex. In our culture, uh, many times that happens through pornography. Statistics tell us that 70% of men in the church regularly view pornography. Nearly 30% of women in the church regularly view pornography. And, and we know that it's wrong. We know that Jesus specifically said, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Or in Romans chapter 13 where it says, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and don't think about how to gratify the desires of your sinful nature. But, but from our perspective, it doesn't seem like viewing pornography is really hurting anybody. Not really hurting us, it's just kind of a little bit of an escape and so we practice selective hearing and we ignore God and we just keep indulging ourselves and because we don't listen to god we miss out particularly those of you who are married when we miss out on the the oneness that god wants us to experience with our spouse a oneness of soul that he wants us to be able to experience we short circuit that blessing see it's hurting us and, and we short circuit the the blessing of relationships with people of the opposite sex because we begin to objectify them. And then what do we do? We find ourselves caught in the bondage of sin because I'm telling you, there's a bondage of sin and addiction that comes in pornography that's all over our culture. You see, the reality is whether we want to acknowledge it or not, whether we want to recognize it or not, we've got a lot more of Jonah. we got a lot more of Jonah in us than we'd like to be able to admit. So remember, the strength of your faith is directly related to your willingness to apply it to places you don't even fully understand. It. You see, that's where our faith grows so much. When we're willing to be obedient to God, and maybe we don't even totally understand all the whys and the ifs and everything, but we trust and we have faith as God gives us direction that we follow that, and in the end, it results in blessing. So watch out for selective hearing. Let's see what happens next in our story. Jonah gets on a ship, he heads toward Tarshish, He's running from God, but the good news is God's running after him. Verse 4, then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to their own God. Isn't that interesting? These pagan guys are crying out to, the, to their God. And, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten their ship. So Jonah runs from God. He finds himself in the middle of this violent storm. And then verse 5 goes on to say, But Jonah had gone below deck where he laid down and fell into a deep sleep. So there's this crazy storm going down that God has sent to really get Jonah's attention, to, to, to draw him back toward himself. But what does Jonah do? He goes below deck and he goes to sleep. And the, the captain, he can't believe what's going on, so he runs below deck, and I think he finds Jonah, and he shakes him. I think so he did. He finds Jonah, he shakes him, man, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. I mean, everybody else is calling on their God. You get up and you call on your God, because we're, we're going to We're going to die. So here's what I want you to notice here in this passage. You know, so many times, because when we practice a selective hearing, when we tr turn, uh, treat God like a consultant, what, the, what happens is it creates a storm. It creates a storm by our own choices. And, and the truth is that that storm doesn't just affect you. That a storm affects all the people that are around you. And you forget that. You forget that that storm that you're in is, is affecting all those people around you. And so many times what happens is we kind of end up being like Jonah and we go below deck and, and we uh, fall asleep. Know that it's affecting other people, your children, your spouse, your parents, your friends. Whether you know it or not, your choices to run away from God and do whatever that you want to do, it's affecting other people. You know, it reminds me of a couple friend of mine that I dearly love. They're awesome people, but the truth is they're falling apart. 
Their marriage is falling apart. And for the most part, the husband is below deck and he is asleep. I think he maybe knows there's a little bit of a storm uh, going on, but he's not willing to take any definitive action regarding his addiction. And so because of his wife and his kids are going through this massive storm, but he's below deck sleeping. And I know that there are some of you here today, bless your souls, you've created all kinds of storms in your life, and, and it's hurting all kinds of other people in your life. And so I want to say to you today, wake up. Please wake up. Please wake up because you're hurting other people because of your own sin that you're not taking responsibility for. It's not just affecting you. It's affecting a whole bunch of people that you actually love, but you're not loving them by your inability to be able to take action regarding your sin. So wake up, stop hurting other people, and start moving in the right direction. Well, the good news in our story is Jonah finally does that. Jonah finally wakes up. Starts doing a little bit of detox, so to speak, in his life. Jonah wakes up, verse 9, and he says, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. So the sailors, they start figuring out, man, this, this, this guy, he, he knows what's going on. And so they ask him, what should we do to calm the storm? And Jonah says in verse 12, pick me up and throw me into the sea, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. But the sailors, they don't want to listen to what Jonah has to say. And in verse 13, it says, Instead, the men did their best to row back to the land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, O Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. And this next part of the story is really the part of the story that I think at least many people are familiar with. This is the part of the story where a whale swallows Jonah. But I want to actually look and point you to what it says in verse 17. In verse 17, it actually says, but the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights. So we don't know for sure that it was a whale. Very well could have been a whale that swallowed Jonah. But we know that it's, it's a great fish, and that fish had some very specific instructions. That fish's instructions were, were swallow, but don't chew. It's not in the scripture. Okay, <laughs> I thought I'd put that out there. But anyway, he sends this great fish, Jonah gets swallowed, and next week we're going to talk more about what happens to Jonah when he's inside of that great fish. But here's one I want you to see. Even though Jonah had taken in all these toxins into his soul, poisoning things of, of treating God like he was a consultant, selective hearing in terms of he wasn't really willing to do whatever God wanted him to do. He wanted to do what he wanted to do. In spite of all these things that he did to really run away from God, God relentlessly pursued him. And the same is true for you and I. Sometimes you and I, in big ways and in small ways, we don't listen to God. We treat God like a consultant. But the good news about God is He's so incredible that He keeps relentlessly pursuing us in love. He wants to be, he wants to be with us. He wants to have a relationship with us. He, want, he wants to give His children the very best things. And when we follow God, we experience health of our souls. Health in our souls, and we experience the very maximum of, of what life has to offer. So know beyond a shadow of a doubt today, if in a big way or a small way, you've been running from God. God has actually relentlessly been pursuing after you. You know, there's a story about a guy named Francis Thompson, and he wrote a poem one time, and Francis was a man who had a lot of financial problems. He was addicted to opiates and, and uh, just made uh, numerous bad decisions. And as he made a lot of those bad decisions, he kept really thinking, man, God is going to turn his back on me. But what he kept experiencing was, even though he made these bad decisions and bad decisions, he kept running away from God, actually God was still relentlessly pursuing him. And so Francis ended up writing a poem. And his poem was called, The Hound of Heaven. And Francis writes, I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. Of my own mind and in the midst of tears, I hid from him. 
And then Francis goes on to describe that even though that he's running from God, every time that he would stop, all of a sudden, he would hear the footsteps of God right behind him. It's kind of like the footsteps of a patient hunter tracking his game. That God, in the same way, if we just stop even in the midst of our running, if we would turn around and listen for just a moment, we would hear the patient footsteps of God coming after us. Know today that if you and I, if we'll just turn around and surrender and let God catch us, He'll swallow us up in His grace. He'll swallow us up in His love. And He'll give us the life and He'll bring health to our souls that we've been longing for all along. So today, wherever you're at in your journey, whether you've been a follower of Christ for a long time or maybe you've never taken that step to know Christ for the very first time, know that if you'll just hold up your hands and surrender, whether it's a big thing or a small thing, that the God of the universe who created you, who made you, will catch you. He'll hold you in His arms and He'll begin to lead you in the way you should go, direct you in the way you should go, and give you the life that you've been searching for from the very beginning. Well, I want to go right now and, and, and pray to that God, that God who chases us. So I just want to ask everyone at all of our locations right now just to bow your head and close your eyes with me. And I want to spend some time talking to God today. And as we begin to pray today, I know that there are some of you here who are followers of Jesus Christ and that you know that you've been drifting from God. You know that there's an area of your life, a, a, a small area or maybe a big area of your life where you've been running from God. And if that's you today, if you know that you've been drifting or you know that you've been running in a big way or a small way, I just want you to raise your hand and admit that to God right now. If you've been running from God in a big way or a small way, or drifting from God, I want you to raise your hand right now at all of our locations. Raise your hand if you've been drifting from God, running from God in a big way or a small way. All of our locations right now, raise your hand if that's you. Praise God, me too. Me too, hands all over. I've got my own ways that I've been running from God. Let me, let me pray for us right, right now. Oh, Father in heaven, I just thank you so much that you are so good. But God, I just pray right now that you would forgive us for our disobedience. Forgive us for how we've ran from you and we haven't done what you've told us to do. Lord, we know that all the man's ways seem right to him, but in the end they lead to death. And so today, God, we just come before you and we confess our sin. And we commit ourselves to detox ourselves from those things which we know are poisoning our souls. Now, I know there's others of you here today that you've never taken that initial step to hold up your hands and to stop running and to surrender to God. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that. It's not by accident that we're here together this morning. It's not by accident that we're talking about the story of Jonah and how he ran away from God. God's speaking to you. He doesn't want you to run away anymore. He wants you to stop and hold up your hands and to call out to him and allow him to catch you. And so today I want to give you that opportunity to be able to hold up your hands, to stop running and to surrender to God and allow him to catch you and surround you with his love and surround you with his warm embrace. So don't miss this opportunity. Don't miss this opportunity today to make this moment your moment and to hold up your hands and to surrender to God and allow him to catch you. So pray this prayer with me right now. Surrender yourself to God. Say this prayer. Oh, Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, that I have ran after other things. But today, Jesus, I surrender to you. I choose you to be the leader and the savior of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins. And now use my life, Jesus, to go out and to rescue other people. Now with everybody's head still bowed and eyes still closed right now, if today for the very first time you raised your hands and you surrendered to God, man, I, as a physical sign of what you've done already in your heart, I want you to raise your hand right now and say to God, that's me, God. I did that today. I surrendered to you. 
wherever you're at, praise God, I see that hand right there. Raise your hand wherever that you're at. Say to God, God, that's me, I surrender to you. Raise your hand wherever that you're at. Say to God, I surrender. I surrender to you. Praise God. Praise God. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, I just thank you so much. Thank you so much, God. Lord, for my brothers and my sisters who surrendered to you. Thank you so much, God, that you run after us. God, even when we've ran away from you, you run after us. Lord, thank you so much for your love. God, that your love, it changes us. And God, your love is so good that you want to give us so many good things if we'll just surrender to you. Lord, we just love you. We bless you. Thank you so much that you've been here today. And we just pray all these things in Jesus' name.